Hi again, everyone. Um, I, I want to call on stage with me uh, my dear five speakers. I'm going to introduce each of you, so please join, join me. So, tonight for the uh, last or almost last session uh, of the day, we're going to talk <coughs> about adventurous capital, which is how we can um, reinvent um, investment to fund uh, um, purpose-driven uh, projects, startups, systems, technology uh, that try to achieve a uh, highest impact. Um, we try to assemble a very um, a diverse crowd of, uh, that all work on finance uh, and, and funding uh, projects, but with different approaches that we want to also compare and, uh, and, uh, and confront. Um, so <coughs> we have uh, Armin. Armin uh, is the founder of Rooted Internet, uh, which is an innovative uh, investment fund for purpose-driven uh, enterprise based in Germany that uh, has a very interesting model that I'm not going to spoil. I will let him uh, explain to you. Um, Willy from Daphne, which is a very new venture capital fund, which tried also to reinvent the way uh, traditional VC works for uh, uh, technology startups. Uh, Laurence Penury from Citizen Capital, which is uh, uh, one of the biggest, if not the biggest, impact investment uh, fund in France today. Pr pretty small, but still, uh, still growing. And uh, Imi and Indy, who are working on like a, a lot of projects uh, in um, uh, in the UK. Imi from is from the Impact Hub uh, Birmingham, and uh, Indy from the Dark Matter Lab. And they work on a new way to uh, activate and form the so so social change. And uh, we're going to to expand the, the discussion from startup financing to system financing together with them. Um, so my first question is actually pretty simple. I would like all of you to uh, explain explain your uh, your approach and your take on on investing in meaningful projects today. Uh, like, what's your view of the investment um, landscape today, and what are you going to to change it? So maybe we're going to to start with you, Willie, if you're okay. Thank you. Um, Daphne is a venture capital fund based in Paris. We are investing in, in Europe in early stages companies uh, specialized in digital activities. Uh, why are we? Uh, what are we trying to change? Uh, in fact, we to to have. I might just make a little um, uh, precision. Maybe for the for the purpose of the panel, you need to understand how is structured a venture fund. In fact, a venture fund is raised by a management companies who can raise several funds. And uh, the, the, the investors, which are called the LPs, limited partner, partners, uh, are, come from three sources of, of people or corporation. There are, there are uh, private individuals, there are family offices, which we, we will call pri private. Then there are corporations like uh, fort Fortune uh, 500 companies. And then there are what we call uh, institutional investors, which could, which could be uh, insurance, banks, and so on. Uh, so you really have to distinguish the management company, which is like any company, but with more re re uh, regulation, and the, and the funds themselves. So for, for us, we, the, and, and just the, the, via, the vehicles, the funds, uh, have some constraints by default. Uh, they, are, they are lasting about 10 years. It, it's about the, the, the timing for a, 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 a startup to, to, to be born and then to, to, to exit. There are three, three kinds of exit, and then I will be briefer. Uh, you, you can uh, either go into the public market, uh, make an IPO. You can uh, sell to a big company, make a trade shift. Uh, or you can be sold to another uh, fine and financial institution like Gross Fund. So this is basically the, the classical landscape of funding now for, for startup companies, and I'm sure lots of, lots, of, uh, lots of us try to change things on it. Our first uh, try is to change the, uh, is to add meaning by adding investors that want to have an impact. And, and uh, hello, <laughs> hello, I don't know who. <laughs> and uh, basically t telling them, um, you can be very close to the companies uh, that we invest in by having access to our deal flow. That's to say, they can uh, 
have access to any information of the companies that are uh, up, up, that apply for our fund, and they are themselves they want to be involved in their in their success. So we bring meaning by uh, bringing this intermediation between our activity, which is basically uh, sorting out the, the best companies that uh, that apply, and uh, and and making all the bad stuff, which is. Uh, which is managing the, the fiscality, the financials, the reports, and all the, all the legal structures that people don't want to do. Thank you, uh, Willy. Um, Laurence, uh, now maybe you can explain um, the, the way citizen capital works and maybe give us an insight of the impact investing uh, landscape. Hello, yeah. Um, Citizen Capital uh, was launched in 2008, so we're already seven years old. And um, our, we launched this fund to use capital to help solve social and environmental problems, particularly social problems, and, um, and have a double target to return money to our, our investors and to generate um, social and environmental impact. And the target of impact investing funds in general, uh, the range of returns, financial returns, can go from just preserving capital. For example, you put 100 in our fund and we try to uh, bring you back 100, to um, market level returns. Um, Citizen capital has four main uh, focuses. The first is um, um, goods, goods and services for bottom of the pyramid, um, addressing vulnerable pe people, and often with business models that take into account this vulnerability. Uh, second issue would be social mobility. Businesses that intrinsically um, aim at, for example, um, building employability for people that are shut out of employment market, um, creating employment in um, hard areas, high rate uh, unemployment, etc. This is a strong NDA in citizen capital is social mobility. Um, people going as long as they can in life, well, going to well, putting their talent, accomplishing themselves, whatever place they were born in or social origin. Um, third is new ways of consumption, and that's where we meet with sharing collaborative models. And the fourth point, was, which is pretty interesting, I think, in, in this context, is uh, not mature yet uh, for us. We haven't invested, but it's social innovation within the organizations um, and in particular on what I would call a value allocation um, and in particular in sharing models one of the issues is um, if you're building your wealth um, on collective intelligence peer-to-peer -peer decentralized models you have to question uh, sharing capital gain of all this Thank you, Laurence. Um, now to move on to Armin, uh, I would like you to explain the model of rooted internet. I think the motivation from what I understood was really to challenge the exit imperative that we see today uh, in uh, uh, VC firms, right? Almost right. <laughs> so the, um, the intention was really to create a different model of how startups and company uh, so the intention was really to create a different model how startups and companies can grow while also staying true to their purpose to their values etc and so that that came somehow out of um, the experience uh, which which uh, many of uh, my friends and also I saw in Berlin and I also experienced um, in my own startup so one of my startups uh, is selling, for example, organic food for children. And so I, um, I've, I had this idea, you know, I want to sell, I want to get children excited for good organic healthy food. 
So that uh, we started with the idea, with the purpose. And then, um, of course, I needed to, to found a legal entity. So I founded a normal, you know, normal legal entity. And, it, um, and then it was only until, I think, two years ago, when one of my employees came to me saying, well, I mean, you know, you're telling, you're telling me um, always we are all working for um, getting children excited for good organic food. But aren't we actually working for you? And we, it's not my, my work investment, so to say, for you because you can monetize it. You can do an exit, you can inherit the company or your, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I had to, I, I thought about it and I actually, I said, well, yes, <laughs> you're right. You are actually working for me, um, for me. That is the current legal structure that we have, the current legal forms that we inherited from our forefathers. And so what, what we do with Rooted Internet is trying to change that. Um, but also trying to um, to change uh, something else. That is, now when when you found a company, you know, uh, you have a good idea, you are purpose driven, and then you you obviously you need money to scale. That's totally fine. And um, but then, and you probably have enough examples yourself, um, and you just have to look perhaps to not only to the US but also in Europe. You start purpose driven you get investors on board they want to have equity they want to have voting rights and step by step you expropriate yourself you know you're becoming from an entrepreneur you become a manager of an actually a speculation object in the <laughs> vc casino as i would uh, call it and 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 you you are step by step then even uh, infected by this profit drive because you're saying well you know if the vc is wanting to make um, 350 percent with me why shouldn't I get also some, some of the Porsches that are coming out there? Uh, I even talked to one we see, uh, I think two weeks ago, who was saying, well, I mean, you know, that's exactly what we want. We want to get in the company and we want to crowd out the intrinsic motivation of the people by extrinsic incentives and making sure that they are money driven as we are because that's the best way to ensure that we have a good rate of return. And um, we don't want them to be purpose driven. So I think there is really something that, and that was like not some small investor that is, he's really investing in also in the big companies, you know, a Silicon Valley investor. So I think there is really we, um, something we need to change. So, and what do we do? We are creating this rooted internet fund that is investing in companies, evergreen, so we never go out, evergreen without exit, without voting rights, under the condition that these companies are self-owned. What do I mean by self-ownership? Self-ownership means the company can stay true to its purpose and make sure legally that always the people who are actually managing and running the company, who are emotionally connected to the purpose of the company, that they are also having the ownership, the voting rights. You know, this, it's the principle of entrepreneurship and ownership are coupled. And um, the second principle of self-ownership is profits are means to an end and not an end in itself. So that means profits are reinvested or used to pay dividends um, or, um, or to pay back investment, to donate, whatever, but uh, it's not really going to the, to the private pocket of, um, you know, of some, some wealthy people. So like this, we have companies that um, give a really clear signal to the investors, to the employees, and also to the clients um, or the customers saying, well, you know, we are really working for the purpose. You're not we are not instrumentalizing our employees to actually maximize the private wealth of some, some investors, etc. And so to make sure that this system works, we have um, we found investors that are um, really, um, really happy to, to uh, invest in such a system with a capped dividend. And that makes sure that you actually have um, people um, in the system that know nobody is, so to say, gear-driven uh, nobody is greed driven, sorry. Nobody is greed driven and that, um, that is, so to say, a, a signal that is um, uh, in the end changing behavior of many people. So, it's really hot here. It's really hot, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Armin. Um, now I want to turn to uh, to Imi. Um, I know that together with Indy, uh, the model you're developing, uh, I think you're, from what I understood, you're really, you're positioning that we 
like founding startups is right, but it's not enough, right? Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm Amy, and um, one of the things that I mentioned yesterday in, in the talk and also um, going to probably explore a little bit more uh, today is that as we, as I embarked on the journey of um, founding an impact hub in Birmingham, which is um, a city outside of London and part of a wave of, of cities across the world where much of this activity is starting to flourish, um, and also working on some accelerator programs, social accelerator programs, uh, in more based in London, but with the ambition to really move out. What we were starting to see was that, one, the legitimacy around what an accelerator was in a city like Birmingham was uh, very interesting. We weren't getting the uptake of ideas uh, in the same speed as you would in some of the major cities. And also, um, the amount of work uh, to, to get sort of to the, even the pre-accelerator stage was incredible, and mainly because the demographic and the issues were understood very differently in a city like Birmingham. And... Um, and what we were starting to find is, as we started to understand more, that if you take a city and you think about its educational outcomes, you know, uh, for example, uh, that it wouldn't just be startups that are, are part of the solution. In an area, there would be, uh, it would be about the schools, it would be about, uh, for example, the type of temperatures that young, uh, young people at right at the bottom of the social economic ladder were sleeping and staying in, if there was damp in their homes, uh, if there was enough teachers, if there was enough, uh, if there were the innovative spaces and buildings, as well as the interesting tech apps, as well as the uh, breakfast clubs. There's so many different layers and different actors that go into deep social change in places that social startups are not the only answer. They're a really important part of the matrix, and it's absolutely important that you find the right um, support mechanisms for them to grow, incubate, accelerate, but alone they weren't enough. So we were seeing multiple uh, cohorts coming out with interesting ideas, interesting products, interesting teams, great collaborative um, uh, experience and cohort over a period of time, but they were still sort of borrowing from the tech model, so 12 to 15 weeks to save the world. Um, they were essentially competing with each other when they graduated, and um, there wasn't a collective intelligence amongst uh, the, the cohort about how to actually make a dent on, on, on any system. So you were seeing good impact in isolation and often actually when they weren't um, have, didn't have a density in a certain place, actually the, the impact was spread all over uh, the country and had minimal uh, actual change. So you were still finding people were stepping over the homeless people to walk into the impact hub. You can see that anywhere. You can see that in Westminster, you can see it in San Francisco. And this really got us thinking about what would the future look like. So actually in a place like Birmingham, for example, you can't just expect everybody to leave their jobs and join an accelerator for however long. Um, not everybody needs 30,000 euros or 50,000 pounds invested in them for their idea. Um, the talk this morning talked really about actually how a lot of the interesting ideas and innovation really came from side projects. Um, and so we started to think about what was a more whole approach. How could we look at startups as having... Um, an important part to play, but actually many other actors, whether it be from citizen campaigning to um, uh, institutions already in the space, and how could we get many, many actors to work together, and what was the stack of finance that was required, whether it be commissioned, whether it be grant funding, whether it be social finance, and to have a more appropriate um, layer of activity. To, and that is also, particularly for, for Birmingham, which I talk about, really focuses on actual issues, because this is where the legitimacy lies in, in places. People don't want to know about the next Uber that's going to come out of Birmingham. They want to know how the child poverty stats that have remained unchanged for 50 years are changing as a result of all of this innovation. So that's really what we're, what, what we're working on or like what I'm working on um, with some of the stuff that Indy's doing at a higher level um, to really understand um, what is appropriate and what is a new model uh, for social change moving beyond just startups but really looking at a systemic approach to issues. Thank you. Uh, Indy, maybe you, you can give us like a quick overview of like on the, on the financial parts of what uh, Imi just described. How, how, how does it work in practice? Um, okay, so I'll, I'll do a little bit a little bit of background in terms of, so we set up a, a social investment fund in both, sorry, sorry uh, we set up a social investment fund in London uh, and an accelerator program, uh, both in India and in, uh, and in London. And in that process, we learned several things. 
One, here's some controversial learnings. Impact funds are very small, usually raising between five to 20 million. And five, between five and 20 million, is that better? Um, uh, they're very small. And actually, when you get into it, uh, good tech accelerator funds are about 120 million. Two, startups in social enterprise spaces don't have an exit, typically. And more, they don't have a J-curve. So if you look at the probability-based investment model that most tech investment funds have structured on, social startups don't operate that like that, nor do they want to operate like that. Thirdly, actually most, of, like the conversation we had last night about democracy, the future of democracy, very quickly you figure out, actually, if you want to invest in any meaningful change, no single point tech solution allows you to get there. So if you want to talk about how we contract into social change or social innovation, you have to point of multiple actors working together, a collaborative model of change around systems. So when you start to think like this, you start to think that financing has a different solution. And here's another little kicker. If you invest in a really good state school, commons, it adds value on private housing in the UK, about 70,000 pounds. So investing in the commons creates value, private value in adjacency. So how do you start to think about these things in new ways? And I was, had the fortune of having a flight on-flight conversation with a Goldman Sachs research director, and we talked about synthetic financing. And when you start to put all this stuff together, you start to think about a new financial model for impact, which isn't based on actually social startups or startups, but actually is about financing systems for change in quite a different way, which organizes capital as a hybrid mixture of capital, but actually puts all these structures together. And I think that's one of the big challenges we face is our narrative has become too narrow on the notion of financing startups when actually we need to be financing change and movements in a much broader sense. And increasingly, here's a magic word I want to put down. What happens when you put down an impact derivative? A derivative, which is a contract of contracts, not focusing on risk mitigation, but actually impact, which organize together to drive some of this stuff. I think that's where the future of social finance will be, both to deliver scale, you know, 100 million, 200 million, the large capital that's required, two, to deliver the impact that's required. Thank you, Indy. Um, I'd like to, um, so I have a question for all of you, but first I'd, I would like to turn back to, uh, to Willie, maybe to react on, on this new, uh, like these new models, and maybe to, to open a question for all of you, which is, I have the feeling that one of, one of, the, um, one of the things that, that comes out of the f this first round of discussion is like um, finding alternative ways to the traditional investment way, which is you invest in exchange for equity. Uh, and about the consequences that 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 can have. So my my question is like, um, um, basically, can we achieve uh, uh, any outcome with um, uh, equity-based model or, or derivative-based model or um, debt-based model? Um, and um, which which model is best for what? Uh, and um, is it possible to? Um, like, is equity-based model really reserved for um, uh, products or technology or project that should scale uh, ve very, very fast, for instance? Or can we apply other models for that? Um, Willy, maybe you can start. Yeah. Can you get this one? Yeah, so this one. Can, yeah. um, in fact, the, the difficulty is always, um, as an invest investor, you're, you're reasoning with an expected payoff. So basically, it's uh, so, so the payoffs that can, you can achieve and the probability of achieving it when you when you fund uh, early stage startups, w which are in in the vast majority uh, failing, uh, the the probability is very high to 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 lose everything. And then, the, if you want to have uh, sufficiently enough uh, expected payoff, you need to uh, ex you need to have a high payoff because the probability is very low. That's that's what makes it very difficult to be sustainable with a uh, with a debt model, and uh, and what's especially difficult in this uh, industry is the, um, the time horizon is very long. So it's very hard to see when a model is working or not, especially because the environment is always changing. So basically, a, a fund is, could be successful. To know if it, if it, if it's, it is successful, you, you need to, to be 10 years after having, having, having lost, launched it. And this is the, the, the first difficulty. And the second difficulty is you, you are basically um, 
in, involved in, a, in an economy of uh, black swans or, or in blockbusters, such as the movies, the music, the, dish, the publishing industry. Or unicorns, we can call yeah, them. Yeah, exactly, and, and unicorns. And if you, if you, in fact, what's, what's very interesting is to, to study the, the, the portfolio of LPs. So basically, the, the professional investors that invest in our funds and that have a lot of comparables. Well, when you see the, 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 the profile of, of, a, of a fund that, that is uh, giving enough profit so a traditional investor can invest, it, the return will be made by two or three companies, mostly one company that is returning all the fund. And so to, to, to be profitable uh, as an investor and for your investor, you, you need to, the, the, the equation is very, is very easy. It's the, the stake that you own in the company multiplied by the, by the, by the growth of the, of, the, of the valuation between the time when you entered and, and when you exited. So, it, it's, so the, so in, in, uh, in the schematically, I've, it's very, it's, it's very uh, uh, hazardous. To, to invest with debt, because debt is made for to mitigate the risk, because you need to, to have the have the have the cash flow back, and in fact, if you so the very so the biggest risk with debt and with any investment is making is making your investor lose lose uh, money, and it's exactly what's happening in lots of crowdfunding activity. So the the the, the, the biggest difficulty of crowdfunding is. Uh, that uh, that a, a management company, a, a venture fund, lose money, it's okay. It, it will just disappear. He made the, the, the wrong choice, but you, you are you are you are wasting the money also also of private individuals, and it's especially uh, a problem when they are not the most w the wealthiest people. But for instance, even beyond debt, like we see, even like traditional VC firms experimenting with the dividend-based models, like. Uh, uh, Aurelie Alpha Tech Ventures, they created Indie.VC, which is like a very small, tiny VC fund that, that doesn't take equity but takes dividends. Uh, after, it, it's, really, it's really a bet. I, I, I don't know if this model can work or not. I, I do believe that you can have an, uh, an, appro an hybrid approach to, to have both uh, equity and debt and to use debt in, in, in what's uh, the easiest to modelize because you, you know... Uh, you know the price of the asset. You know the, the cash flow that, that you should uh, get back. When you when you invest in a in a very um, ra let's say random or it's a very um, uh, uh, risky a ri risky risky growth with debt, uh, you mostly lose it. And in fact, in fact, your upsides are, are not high enough to reimburse the the what you what you put in. But it's it's interesting to know. Uh, for you, especially uh, who are investing in debt, what is your view? Well, I, I would like to make um, a very general stance on your question. You know, how does this um, this different financing instruments, perhaps, you know, how do they change? I think uh, one thing, and I am really interested whether we agree on that. One thing that is from became for me more and more clear: we're gonna see in the next 20 years really a reinvention of understanding of ownership. Either we see it by, um, by design or we see it by, um, by, by crashing and, or by, by revolutions because the thing is that how the current ownership system works, we produce, you know, you know, know all this, the inequality, you know, we produce a system in which we treat companies like speculation objects in which and I, I know many companies, uh, especially between the phase when they got um, sold to a big um, to a big company, you know what happens inside the companies, what happens with the people that have been sold, how they feel being so to say an, an object. I think that really has to change because it's not anymore it's not anymore in line with what we actually feel. Like hundred years ago, we said we don't want to have slavery. What are companies, I'm asking you? Companies are a collection of people, Ma humans. Why can we sell companies? Why are companies even having a price? I would say, you know, we have to get rid of that notion and that has to happen in the next 20 years. So that's why I'm so much saying, you know, there's really something um, changing and I, th I think it's in the direction of investors will, ha will have probably less voting rights 
And this won't be bad for them. Just look at the big companies, look at Alibaba, look at um, Facebook, look at Google, look at LinkedIn. All of them that had the possibility made sure that the majority of their voting rights stayed with the management and the founders. Larry Page, and it's a really a great read, read the, the IPO letter that Larry Page wrote to his shareholders when they, uh, when they go, uh, went to the, to the um, stock market. He wrote, well, you have to know we are issuing today shares that have very, like, uh, like, um, very, very um, small voting rights. Why? Because we want to have the control and we think that's good for you because we stay passionate about what we do. We're not doing what you do, want us to do, but we, we do what we want to do and that's probably, and we believe that, best for you. And I think that's, so that there is this, um, currently the VCs are thinking, you know, we need some security. We need to make sure that we can, um, we can go in the company, fire people, etc., etc. But I think that, that really has to change and that then also changes um, the way we perceive companies. Because I think, you know, companies are, are not ownable in itself, on the one hand, on, so at least this, but on the other hand, they should be owned by the ones who are actually leading it. And, and so I think that the, this ownership understanding really has to be debundled. We're currently um, thinking of ownership as, ownership is like being able to do everything with it. Like, you know, I'm owning this glass, I can destroy it, I can inherit it, I can whatever, do whatever I want with this. But this is an ownership understanding that is coming from the Roman Empire. You know, from the Romans that were just thinking, you know, uh, that's an object, so, well, you are the owner of the object, so you can do everything about it, you can exclude a anybody, but, etc. But our economists are today already much further than our um, lawyers. Uh, our economists are talking about a bundle of, of rights. So the one thing is um, the right to, to use it, the other thing is the right to have dividends, to sell it, etc. Et and I have to, I, I just um, say, we probably have to rebundle ownership rights um, when it comes to companies, and that then will also change the VC um, system in a, in a different direction. Thanks. Laurence, I think you wanted to, to react on this uh, ownership question. Yeah, I wanted to react on the ownership issue. Um, I totally agree with you that ownership is one of the key issues in this century. And when I hear you all in the type of economy in which you are, ownership I is, is a key issue. Um, and in fact, I, th I see three barriers uh, for finance today, um, which are not adapted to this economy that I see here, is ownership, profitability, and sharing a purpose. Sharing a purpose is is um, is a very difficult. It's the only thing we I think we have part of an answer today because we don't have a real answer for the two others. But sharing a purpose is is. Um, sharing a commitment um, with the company as an investor on um, the purpose we want to achieve together. That means we, 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 um, uh, our contract uh, and our relationship, the, con the, the sh shareholder contract integrates a social purpose which can mean even uh, a special type of exit strategy. Lots of entrepreneurs come to us t today and say, okay, you're an impact investing fund, right, but um, I'd like to know how, what's your exit strategy? Is it only maximizing value? Because I'm not gonna sell my company to anyone. So sharing a purpose goes pretty far and we're working now with uh, some researchers from Mean Paris Tech that maybe you know, some of you know, Blanche Segrestin and Armand Atchuel, that are working on, um, well, ev evolution of governance, corporate governance and theory of agency, and it's a critical point of view on this, and um, how um, you can share a purpose in the long term to preserve um, company's purpose beyond uh, shareholder changes which is a very hard thing to do, in, in fact. And what um, I don't, well, I don't agree fully with what you said is 
why should investors um, get completely out of what you call uh, voting rights? We don't, call, we don't call that at all in, in private equity. It's just, are you passive as an investor? Are you hands-on? And we're completely hands-on. So we would have, I mean, I would never have created, launched a, a fund just to put money. And I think there's a place for VC funding that's hands-on um, and it has a word to say, uh, but not the way probably it's done today. And this is all the work, what well, I think, in, that can go up to legal status, but maybe not, but that's in the commitment, uh, or maybe you could say just shareholder contract on what, mm. you, how you want to, mm. um, yeah. well. So, so the challenge for entrepreneurs is to find a um, hands-on VC that will not break the engine, basically. Yeah, yeah. and w uh, what I heard of Primavera just before yeah. was very interesting because I think uh, VCs have lots of, lots of, uh, lots to learn from decentralized funding uh, initiatives, and that maybe decentralized uh, funding initiatives have to learn also from VC experience. And uh, I think collaboration is uh, richer than just passive money. Uh, yeah. in, some, in some kind of... Um yeah, I need to keep the mic. Well, you <laughs> but, but you can, you can very quickly well, and then I... I I'm, I'm really not, uh, just to clarify it, I'm really not talking about passive money in that way. I'm talking about making sure that the, ecos uh, that the, the company itself stays self-owned in a way that those who are actually operatively and, and um, who are also strategically really involved in that company, that are feeling the purpose, that they are, uh, who are executing it, that they also decide. You know, we have this thing that, um, and that is also what um, uh, shareholder value co um, driven companies do, they, they tear apart decision making power and executing and feeling the consequences. And you know, that, that system, we in Germany, we experienced it very well by Hitler. He, he, did, uh, he um, put some people into the office building deciding things, others executing, and others feeling the consequences. And I, I think if we want to have responsible systems and also sustainable systems, we have to put heads, heart, and hands together. So you need to make sure those who are executing it, who are directly involved, need to also have the deciding power. So if you are a VC and you are really actively involved in that company, well, you have also some voting power, but as soon as you leave, your voting power will, be, will go away. Yeah. I think this is the very first time we reached the Godwin point at, at Wisherfest, so this is uh, the, the Godwin point. <laughs> um, uh, Indy and Amy, uh, do you want to react on uh, um, the second part of this discussion? Uh, I think that the interesting part, so I, I agree with the ownership conversation, the other part of this story right. is how, f how funds are structured. So I often call venture capital funds heroin funds. So the, sorry for anyone who takes heroin. I apologize to you. But, um, but because venture capital is effectively structured around rapid growth, and it has to drive a 10-year exit in order to finance backwards out of the story, which means really quite a lot of good companies are destroyed in the process of getting to that growth milestones. So there is a kind of ownership conversation, but I think you've sidestep the problem beautifully by creating an evergreen fund with a kind of effectively an equity structure and a dividend structure in it. There is a kind of conversation how we structure capital in the funds itself, which will change the nature of what the capital goes out of the system as well. So there's a, there, is a, uh, there is a question about if what the nature of exit and what the relationship. And one of the things that we did do was look at participation agreements uh, in social companies, I think participation agreements are really interesting. So you take a participation on revenue rather than looking for equity, which means you can finance a charity or not-for-profit, uh, cooperative, uh, any form of legal entity because you actually work on the revenue side of the story with a cap, which means you can start to have a different type of relationship with business. So I think we have to look at new funding structures as well as actually the ownership structures to get to the top story. I think just building on that a little bit is is when we talk about we it, and the title of this panel as well about adventurous capital. Um, who who is we? Because we're currently in cre have pretty much created our own bubble of people people we're talking to, people who can even begin to participate in what what this story is about. And the m most of the time, the challenges that we're trying to 
soul will be part of are so far away from us and so far away from this conversation. So I think the the mixture of being hands-on is also about what does hands-on look like? What does hands-on look like in, in cities? Where are funders actually getting to to ensure that the stats are different, whether that's uh, with women, whether that's a people of colour, whether that's so many other factors that are not uh, actually talked about in these panels. So I think the ability to be able to go to a, a broader structure will also mean that we can actually be far more intentional of who we is because I think that is a real problem and if we carry on down this cycle um, we're at risk of really creating yet another bubble that a whole load of other people are going to be kind of uh, um, standing up against so I think the revolutions are, are many and we need to be able to step back and actually look critically at who and what we are funding and where does our adventurous side come from and where is our uh, actual intentionality in being involved is it just in the ones that we're funding or are we fundamentally trying to change what we're actually doing. Just building exactly on that point, look at where your venture capital funds are, are held. They're all held in the Parises, the Londons, the kind of Singapores, the San Francisco's of the world. Yet we know there's a capital shortfall pretty much in every other city outside there as well. So how do we move startup or innovation capital as a broad save beyond the kind of beyond the narrow narrative of Paris and London, right? Because unless we can do that, there's also a structural question. And what is the nature of innovation in those environments? Because Paris and London is great for products and services, but maybe those other places innovate in a different way and have a different capacity for innovation. So there is a kind of bigger question about how do we bring capital outside the kind of capital cities of the world? Thank you. Uh, we have uh, just uh, one minute to, to finish. I would like, just as a last opening question, um, to uh, get back on what Laurence, uh, you mentioned uh, Primavera and the blockchain and decentralized uh, uh, fund. This is a topic that's been uh, recurring at WishFest this year. Um, actually, there is this uh, DAO thing, which is to oversimplify a decentralized autonomous fund, which raised uh, 150 million worth of crypto equity, if we could say. Um, what's, your, what's your reaction about this? Like, Do you, do you think that the blockchain technologies and decentralization are going to transform investments and, and uh, in, in project and system financing? Uh, DAO is, is a very interesting move. Uh, I think that the main challenge of it is, uh, no, the main advantages of it is um, you can access to the money of everyone and uh, everyone's money, make make really a tons of money and, and it can uh, fund a really interesting project that, that classical venture funds or private equity funds wouldn't do. Uh, the, the, the big uh, challenges is uh, who are really making the, the analysis of the, of the applications, like the due diligences, which is really uh, so most, most of the, so the hard parts of our jobs. And also, the, the risk is having passive money, uh, and you, 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 as, a f as an entrepreneur, you, you, ha you have two choices, basically. You, you think money is, is, a, uh, is a mean for your growth, and you, wanna, you, you want to, to keep control of your, com your company, and it's, uh, it, it can be a good way to do it. Uh, or you can, you can, you can say, uh, I, I need to, to have partners that help me grow the company, and uh, the blockchain uh, initiative won't uh, allow you to, to have access to this intelligence, or you really need to build lots of in infrastructure structures uh, above it. Maybe it's a smart contract that will help you to build your company. <laughs> Anybody else want to react, and we have to close? My reaction would be quite similar, I would say especially in early stage funding, I'm not yet quite sure whether this, the DAO will, um, will succeed because in early stage, it's, also, it's of course about the idea that you get um, on the table, but it's also like about the people, about the people, about the people. And uh, you look and you see, you know, what, how do they present the idea? Can you, do you have a feeling of trust? Would you like to do vacations with them or not? You know, these are the questions you have to, ans uh, you have to ask yourself. And I'm really um, wondering who is going to see the people if this is an anonymous thing where you don't even know who is having the, uh, the tokens, yeah. etc. cetera. So I, perhaps for big uh, projects that, that might work, but for early stage yeah. things, I'm a bit skeptical. You just see the Ethereum address, basically. I, I think uh, you'll see 
blockchain being used on the fund management side, so organizing funds from multiple actors working together, that's where you'll see blockchain. I think uh, fund management and blockchain will come first before we'll see anything on DOAs, because that's where I think we see easy wins, where multiple partners are organizing capital together using open structures, and that's where, that's where we're seeing the first wins. All right. Um, thanks a lot to everyone. We are going to uh, move now to the, to the terrace for the, for the Q&A. So if you want to continue the conversation with us, you're welcome there in a, in a minute. Thanks you all for uh, coming. <laughs>